All right, hello everyone. Um, my name is Ricky Yamauchi. I'm the Managing Director of Double Feather Partners. Um, I am here with Yannick, my colleague. Um, and today, uh, welcome to uh, the roadshow of African Venture Capital and private, private Equity in Japan. The first stop is in Kyoto here on this beautiful day. And I want to show and express um, utmost uh, gratitude and appreciation for um, the Kyoto uh, Prefecture, City, um, Jetro, and everyone who was in, involved in supporting this program. Um, today will be a, a three hours, but a very unique experience. We have founders, entrepreneurs, private equity. Uh, obviously, we have Africa Invest, uh, one of the most established uh, investment fund, uh, VC and private equity uh, in Africa. So we will be welcoming um, the Africa Invest team later on as well. Um, just quickly, in terms of agenda, uh, we will be introducing um, this venue, uh, this beautiful temple on Daitokuji. Um, and then we'll have an opening remark from the Kyoto um, side. And, and then um, the FP and Africa Invest will be talking about um, all the interesting innovation happening in Africa and how we want, we would like to kind of make connection with Japan. Um, after that, we will have a break and then we will have uh, four startups um, coming up and pitching uh, up here. And then we'll have, uh, we'll be closing with a networking session. Um, so that's kind of like the general uh, flow. And we'd like to kick it off. I'd like to hand over the mic um, to Mr. Sasaki. And he will be talking about um, the temple and the history. Um, so Sasaki-san from um, Kyoto Mediation Center, uh, please uh, take over the mic. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction. And uh, for those who, are, who don't feel well, uh, there's an air-conditioned room available. Just so please let us know in case you don't feel well. And uh, if you need to go to the restaurant, just let us know. And I'm Sasaki, and I work here at this temple uh, as an administrative chief secretary. And I also, myself, have a startup uh, in meditation wellness application. Uh, welcome to Japan and welcome to Kyoto and welcome to our Zen temple. This Zen temple was built about 700 years ago, backed up by the emperor and the royal family then. Since then, uh, we have been uh, favored and supported by the politicians and business executives and etc. This building was built about 500 years ago and uh, it has not burned down one single time. So this is the very original architecture. And we used to have many guests like uh, samurais in the past. Samurais in the past were not just military commanders, but also business executives and uh, investors and politicians as well. And they were very, very busy and they were constantly under strong pressure. So they needed something to reduce stress. So they turn to uh, Zen meditation and tea ceremony, and they would often come to this temple to uh, calm down, calm themselves down, so they can uh, make uh, better decisions. I hope today uh, participants are like Sunrise in the past, because you are very, very busy. So I, I hope you are going to have a wonderful moment at the temple and a great memory here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sasaki-san. Um, now from here, uh, we'd like to pass it on uh, to Mr. Uh, Kawaguchi, the Deputy uh, GM for Startup Promotion at uh, Kyoto Chiyomori. So Kawaguchi-san, thank you very much. Uh, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, my name is Takashi Kawaguchi. Okay, I'm sat as a uh, staff member of Kyoto Startup Ecosystem Promotion Council. And uh, let me uh, explain about myself a little bit. Actually, I go in uh, Osaka and living in Kyoto for five years. And also, I engaged in the industry promotion in Kyoto City Office uh, more than two years. And also, I'm part of the team. Yeah, let me start it. Uh, okay, uh, once again, welcome to Kyoto. And so, before uh, the uh, the panel and the startup pitch. Uh, let me introduce about Kyoto startup ecosystem a little bit. Uh, Ansan. Ansan. Hi, An. 
Uh, can you, can you, uh, uh, can I, uh, may I ask you one thing? Uh, when you hear Kyoto, what comes to your mind first? Yes. <laughs> great, great answer. Yeah. And may, actually, the main, many people think that Kyoto is a very famous uh, tourist, tourist city in the world. And also, but uh, recently, uh, Kyoto is becoming the famous as a city of the startup friendly city. Here's an outline of the Kyoto startup. Uh, actually, so as much as we recognize uh, the number of startups uh, of 450 plus, and uh, regarding the base startup, uh, which certified, uh, certified uh, startups uh, such as uh, high potential and also rapid growth, growthly, and also uh, high potential to becoming a unicorn. Uh, after it, uh, the number is uh, uh, 20 plus, but it, it is the highest in the Kansai area. And regarding the number of startup uh, participants in the top tier acceleration program uh, supported by JETRO and also the Japan government, uh, actually the number is also 14. It is the second highest in Japan after Tokyo. Yeah. Also the after uh, 2021, uh, excellent university uh, launch startups uh, were still born here in Kyoto uh, based on the uh, deep tech. Uh, for example, uh, uh, Optimus uh, left side of the slide uh, develops the transparent solar cells, uh, which, uh, which is very uh, epoch making technology. Also, in, in 2022, uh, the startup successfully raised uh, more than 1 billion yen uh, in only uh, equity finance. Uh, there are also several buyout cases, uh, mainly in university startups. So it doesn't work. Please look next. Please a moment, please. <laughs> okay. Uh, in terms of global ranking, uh, actually Kyoto Startup Ecosystem ranked a third in Japan uh, and the top 30 in Asia in the Startup Latest, uh, Startup Genome Latest Report. Okay. Uh, but what did happen uh, before uh, answering this, these reasons, uh, let me explain about a little bit about the momentum in Japan. Uh, actually, the so, uh, Japanese government uh, has focused on very much uh, supporting startups and also uh, enhancing the ecosystem uh, in Japan. Uh, that is essential to the support. And maybe the, some of you may know uh, in July 2020, after Kyoto and Osaka and Kobe, which are neighbor city of Kyoto, uh, certified as the area. Uh, with the high potential grow up, grow, global startup path. Yeah, here is an uh, overview of the plan we made. Uh, please notice the left side. Uh, actually, so Kyoto's ecosystem is not complete uh, only among us, but also uh, coordinate or cooperate with the overseas ecosystem. So, so that's why I, I hope this event uh, will be an opportunity to do so. Please next. Uh, so, uh, okay. Also, uh, we made a consortium uh, that I belong. Uh, it's established in 2019, December, and it consists of over 30 uh, organizations such as uh, local government, and uh, also finance institution, VC accelerators. Uh, it means the momentum is building. Yeah, so next reasons. Actually, uh, there are many reasons why Kyoto can be, but uh, we think uh, these three uh, are key to understand why. Our first one is about industry structure. Actually, so the target is for innovation in the 
of the city the first uh Kyoto has uh many uh, manufacturing companies such as Nintendo, Midek, Kyocera, Murata, and also uh, supporting industry or SME uh, for, for support them uh, many in here. Uh, also, the second is that Kyoto was the capital of Japan for the past thousand years, and so it retains uh, traditional craft, also culture, and uh, culture also like uh, many kind of industry inside the city. Yeah. And also it influenced to the startup, the business domain. Maybe you can see like that many kinds of startups in Kyoto, especially the more significant uh, reasons why is existence of Kyoto University. Actually, so uh, there are many startups uh, comes from the uh, Kyoto University, especially in the life science, also the innovation field. Yeah. And the second is about the human resources. Uh, actually, so uh, Kyoto is very famous, known as the student town. And there are 30 universities in the city, and also the number of uh, students is percent of population in Kyoto. The number is uh, 150,000, and also 10,000 student comes from uh, abroad in the international students. Yeah. And also regarding the Nobel Prize winner, the number is 11. Uh, actually, so if I can uh, include those who are related to the number will be the 14. It counts, it counts for uh, about a half of all Japanese Nobel Prize winner. So, so we can say like uh, Kyoto has the big potential to provide uh, uh, talented students, also researchers, and also future CEOs. Please next. So next. Uh, next, please. Yeah, okay. The last one is city proximity. Uh, okay, so by showing this map, uh, let me uh, explain about it. Uh, so it's very small and also it's written in Japanese. Uh, but you can see like two circles, the blue one and the red one. Actually, it's a blue one uh, represents three kilometer radius. And also, uh, red one represents five kilometer radius. And also, you can see the like the big ball, uh, which put the number, uh, means like element of uh, startup support, such as uh, incubator facility, also VC accelerator, uh, co working space. Um, uh, I want you to focus on the fact that 80% uh, of the element, I mean, uh, the elbow inside three kilometer radius, uh, actually, so uh, proximity uh, generate innovation uh, in the research. So it's just hypothesis, but it assumes that uh, uh, Kyoto's uh, innovation is leading this proximity, I guess. <laughs> Again. Okay. For example, like Global Accelerator also coming in Kyoto, uh, for example, Play on Play Kyoto. Uh, they set up the office, a branch office in Kyoto, and they have a program of the hard tech and healthcare and new materials, uh, which are strengths in Kyoto. Please go ahead. Next. So, next. Okay, so finally, so let me touch on the uh, about the uh, corporate attraction. Uh, in, recent, in recent years, uh, global startups and also the companies, uh, this is on the first section, uh, Tokyo Soft City Market, have been established R&D in the business center in Kyoto. So, uh, as I mentioned first, uh, Kyoto is famous for uh, tourist city, but not just for sightseeing. Uh, Kyoto is the beginning to attract attention as a place to work and live. Okay, maybe it's a, yeah, okay. So maybe it's our time, and also thank you for uh, listening. Actually, so uh, I skipped, uh, I have to skip the many details I would like to share with you. So if anyone uh, want to know about more, so please tell me. I'll be there uh, until the end of the event. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Harvard-san.
Um, yeah, we were just there in Plug and Play Kyoto office this morning, and you know it's fantastic to see there's a lot of corporates trying to work with global accelerators for open innovation and really kind of bridging the geographical um, gap between the Japanese startups, the Kyoto startups, and like the global um, the market as well. Um, so up next will be um, actually from myself. So I'll be covering um, some of the global or the macro environment. Um, touching also on what we do as Double Feather Partners in Africa. Um, and then we'll also be touching on what kind of activities that we have been seeing, witnessing um, in terms of investment from Japanese corporates and VCs into Africa, which has been a really kind of rising momentum. Um, so first off, yeah, Double Feather Partners, we are a Japan-based but Africa-focused uh, investment and advisory um, firm. Um, we also run an accelerator uh, together with, with the backing of JICA, uh, which is Japanese uh, VFI. Um, and so we'll be kind of touching on that. Um, so, next. yeah. So, again, um, our core businesses is our investment, advisory, consulting, research, um, and accelerator. And to introduce our team, uh, we have a team of about 13. Um, so um, I think myself, uh, coming from investment banking, uh, Morgan Stanley, uh, we have many people from background of um, from finance and also marketing and PR. Um, we have people in Japan, uh, Europe, and in Africa as well. So we have local members uh, in Kenya, Uganda, um, South Africa, and Nigeria. Okay, so I'd like to start off just talking about more of the macro environment. Um, given that you know recently in finance, I think whether you're you're in corporate, uh, you're a venture capital or a startup, I think we're all feeling these um, changes. Um, the market condition has been drastically volatile. Um, so this is kind of what we, how we view it. Um, so given you know we kind of try to think about the global context first. Um, so currently, the market we have, we are really in like an uncharted water. Um, it's a very difficult time for entrepreneurs, investors to figure out, you know, what the world is going through, what's going to be on the other side. Um, so this is kind of like a mapping talking about um, the climate of business in public markets, private markets, developed markets, and also emerging markets. And from this, uh, we believe that you know there's there's going to be a volatile time for the next you know half a year, um, 12, 12 months, uh, with a lot of the, the policy changes, central banks, um, and also um, even the geopolitical issues that are going on. Um, but on the other side of the tunnel, like we are still um, optimistic, cautiously optimistic about um, the emerging markets and also in, uh, especially in the private sector. So this is where we focus on. Um, this is also what Africa Invest has been um, focusing on. Um, so we like to kind of dig in further um, in that space and why it's important to kind of focus on that market right now and how Japanese corporates and investors can be part of this journey um, of this um, exponential growth that um, Africa is going to experience in the near future. So diving into the African um, ecosystem. So I think you know it's quite obvious that you know macro wise top down that Africa is growing. Uh, people talk about the population growth. Um, people talk about you know the macro growth and the GDP, how it's going to be the last frontier market. Um, but we want to focus more on the, the bottom up. So we want to really kind of provide more transparency of what's actually happening on the ground because I think we all learn um, that innovation doesn't necessarily happen just top down. Um, the government the government can't force innovation to happen forcefully it has to be really um worked between the public market and the private market collectively um so we want to kind of focus on what is happening on, on the mi micro level from the bottom up with the startups and the vcs um so this is last year 2021 data um and in terms of the amount of funding that has gone into african vcs last year is about uh, four spot seven eight billion um so if you look if in comparison, in, in Japan, it's about five to six. So I think it became almost on par. And I think this year, um, if we continue this pace, I mean, we're, we're in July. 
Um, so uh, the African startup ecosystem it is set to hit to be able to hit about eight to nine billion um, at this rate. And obviously, um, in this global market, where you know from Silicon Valley to um, Japan to Europe and China, I think a lot of funding has actually have been coming down. And um, compared to that, obviously in Africa, I mean, the hurdle is still you know because it's low, but it is still growing double digit every year. And we expect that um, this year alone uh, will also hit a historical high, and we expect this momentum to continue uh, going forward. So right now, despite that African population is set to hit about 25% of global population by 2050, um, right now, I think global funding wise, they only make up about um, really like two or 3%. Um, so there's a lot of catch up room. Um, and you know, I, I think if you have kind of looking into the startup ecosystem, how that happened in China 20 years ago or Southeast Asia like 12 years ago or India seven years ago, I think it makes sense that you know Africa is going to be the you know, also be going, going to be catching up, and because of the technologies that we have now, I think that uh, velocity of change and also the rate of uh, innovation happening, we think will be very very fast in Africa. Um, So again, this is the, the trends on the left-hand side. That's the number of deals that has been having uh, occurring uh, in Africa. And I think there's on the headline, there's a lot of headlines on the later stage rounds. So the, you know, the series D's and the, you know, the, I, the IPO ones. Um, but actually a lot of the funding is happening more on the earlier stage. So series A, uh, which is where we focus on. We believe that there's advantages of going into Africa hands-on like locally and engaging with the entrepreneurs at a very early stage to be able to identify um, the next breakthrough innovation and technologies. Um, in terms of location, yeah, it might be a bit slow, but in Africa, obviously you can't talk about Africa like generally, um, it's 54 con uh, countries and it's 54 different markets. Um, the biggest uh, market in terms of startup uh, investment and VC funding uh, investments has been in four majors, I would say, the past um, five years. So it has been in Kenya, um, Nigeria, obviously, uh, South Africa, and uh, Egypt. So these four has been kind of the more the developed markets and where a lot of the VCs have been focusing on. But we have um, definitely seen more um, trend towards the, not the second tier, but other markets that are very becoming interesting as well, such as Uganda has been very interesting. There's a lot of interest going towards North Africa and West Africa, obviously African investors from Tunisia. Um, so it's a very, very unique and upcoming market. Um, so I think there are uh, plenty of opportunities. Uh, the tailwinds uh, in terms of Africa, it, for example, is the fact that they have implemented the free trade agreement for Africa. Um, so this has been talked about from 2013, but the, in terms of implementation, it's really about to happen um, this year. So we, we feel that for example, like Africa, the inter-regional trade in Africa is only about 16%. If you look at EU, the inter-regional trade in EU is about 65%. So if Africa could really trade amongst itself and not have to depend on outside um, in terms of uh, trade um, and commodities, then I think that will really um, create a momentum for Africa, uh, each country uh, to, for their growth. Um, So this is just to kind of connect where we are in Japan and what's, what's been happening. So I understand there's like small words, but um, there's been very um, high level of cross-border M&A amongst Japanese corporates. And I think this is necessary because obviously Japan is not a growing, but it's, uh, you know, in terms of demographics, it's a shrinking uh, population and economy. So on the left upper hand side, the dark blue, um, shows the number of deals that's more um, domestic. So there's a lot of, there has been a lot of domestic m and but if you look at the bottom chart, the light blue, that's the cross border. Um, so I think Japan, um, the Japanese corporates, they have a lot of cash in hand. So on the right hand side, this is from the FT, uh, it shows the number, the ratio of corporates that are sitting on net the cash, so net cash. So if you look at um, the Japanese corporates, about 58% of the corporates are sitting on cash, their net cash. 
um, if you if compared to the US, it's about 16%. So in Japan, we have a lot of cash in hand, um, but uh, so the way for them to expand globally and become more competitive globally, there's been a lot of appetite of doing more kind of these like M&A, private equity types of um, acquisitions. Um, and this is just kind of the breakdown of the M&As that, that, that has been happening in emerging markets. So I think before, um, Japanese corporates tend to buy companies, acquire companies in developed countries like Europe and US um, to capture the new technologies. Oftentimes, these acquisitions are happening at a very high price tag. So they will be um, spending you know, hundreds of millions and billions to acquire um, corporates, uh, other foreign corporates. But I think, you know, being in finance and witnessing this, um, that has not been always the most successful because basically you're kept, you're buying at the top, at the peak. Um, so there has been more shift towards investing in earlier stage companies at private um, so that they get a better deal. Um, so on the right-hand side, the chart, this is from the World Bank data. Uh, essentially, these are the acquisitions in Africa that has been happening. I think the most famous acquisition, um, the most successful is by Toyota Tsusho. So Toyota Tsusho probably is one of the very few Japanese corporates um, that has been very active in Africa and be successful. How they did that is not going stand alone. You know, they have paired up, they have acquired stakes of Cepal, which is a French conglomerate uh, trading company that has been always um, present in Africa. And together with them, um, they have create, done develop, uh, business development. They also launched two funds um, that is dedicated purely on Africa. Um, more recently, um, Sojitsu, another trading company, acquired a portfolio company of uh, African private equity uh, uh, PE fund called Helios. They're UK based and they're active in Africa. So we believe that there's um, more and more opportunities for Japanese corporates um, to work with global players, private equity players, um, and negotiate and talk about you know, potential deals um, which would be, um, you know, opportunity for Japanese corporates to make the footprint in Africa and working with global players, not just going um, solo. So the past several years, there has been a lot of uh, transitions from Japanese corporates and VCs into Africa. And this is just kind of picking up uh, so the past, I think, I believe it was like past just three years. Um, just want to touch on a couple of interesting ones. Um, for example, I guess Aza Finance is a fintech company from South Africa. Now they have, they're, you know, way beyond unicorn. And for this company, I think Sompo Holdings acquired 10% stake at early stage and the SBI joined after that. Essentially in Africa, you know, the biggest, one of the most difficulties when doing business outside of the trade, which I mentioned earlier, is the currency issue, where if you want to do business from Nigeria to Kenya, because th these are both minor currencies, you have to kind of make it, make it a dollar first, and then again, to the minor currency. So there's kind of double commission, and the fee to do trade is about, it could be up to like 30%. But now we have the blockchain technologies um, utilizing, you know, for example, Bitcoin, uh, which has liquidity to be able to make that trans transaction much more seamless. So that brought down the, the trading uh, fee uh, to single digit. So this company has grown outside beyond Africa. Now they are active. They're also in uh, other emerging markets and developed countries. Quara is a fintech company that went through the Ninja Accelerator program that um, Yannick here is championing with JICA. Um, they are early stage, but uh, they, I think last year, landed uh, the first SoftBank's uh, seed round, uh, 4 million deal. So we're pretty happy about uh, these kind of trans uh, transactions that has occurred through our program um, from these global players. Um, I think Zipline is worth highlighting, given that it's probably the most successful startup. Uh, it's a drone company uh, that delivers medicine and um, blood. So this is... This is one great example of where the technologies that you can't test in developed countries. You know, you can't fly drones in Kyoto, for example, because there's danger of accidents happening. But in Africa, um, you know, the municipals and the governments are happy to work with startups that has technologies to create new, new business models that could overcome these social issues. In Africa, many of the rural areas, uh, people do not have access to um, go to the hospital. 
you know, there are not, not, you know, there's not roads that you could drive quickly on uh, swiftly to go to hospitals and access healthcare. So this company with technology overcame that. It, it's, it came out of San Francisco, but became a unicorn out of Rwanda. Uh, and now they are actually coming to uh, developed countries. So Zipline was invested by Toyota Tusho at Series C. And this year uh, they are coming to Japan uh, in southern Japan, because Japan is also facing uh, the biggest social issue Japan, one of is the Asian population. And a lot of the, the elderly people have, do not have access to healthcare, um, you know, physically and sometimes financially as well. Um, so this technology is coming to Japan this year to, with Toyota Tusho. Um, Washa, right next to it, is a Japanese startup out of University of Tokyo. Um, but 99% of the operation is happening in Africa. So they started off in Uganda. Uh, they provide um, lanterns, like lightings, uh, to uh, people in the villages. Uh, so they use, um, they work with Marubeni, uh, one of the trading companies, also Kansai um, Electric. So Kansai Electric provides them the solar panels so that the solar panels could be on the kiosks. Um, and then they could charge uh, the lanterns and provide it at a low cost. Um, so we also invested into a Japanese startup that uh, was spun out of Tsukuba University um, and also did uh, help with the BD in Africa. So, you know, I understand that Kyoto, you know, is the city I believe that has technologies, deep technologies, um, a very high level of academics, uh, but not necessarily have the mindset of, you know, entrepreneurship or, you know, business expansions overseas. So we believe that um, there's much more opportunities that are not tapped in, um, in Kyoto. Uh, so we like to definitely kind of put a spotlight there and be able to kind of have these um, dialogues with the ecosystems in Kyoto. Um, yeah, it's just a couple more minutes from me. Um, this is to show that they're global VC, um, well, very um, established uh, VCs that are focusing on Africa now. Um, so the left upper hand side is a bit tough to tell, but the blue is the US investments into Africa and yellow is from Europe and orange is local African VCs and the light blue is Asia. Now, what this is saying is that in Africa, uh, the total amount of funding, which I mentioned was about 4.78 billion as of last year, uh, of that about 65% in total is coming from the US and Europe. Um, only 20% is coming from the local VCs and then from Asia, it's about 8%. Uh, Japan's probably probably one percent or so. So we believe there's a lot of uh, potential loss opportunities for Japanese corporates and VCs um, if we don't enter um, at this time. Um, yeah, and I think a lot of people have this perception that China is very um, you know committed to Africa, and they are. But this is more towards the you know the infrastructure and building roads and stuff. In terms of technologies and VCs, we. On the ground, we definitely see more presence from um, US players and Europeans. Okay. And lastly, yeah, these are some of the companies that we work very closely with that has announced publicly that they're entering Africa. And, you know, speaking to them, it's not always the, uh, the traditional legacy businesses like natural resources or commodities. These companies are actually coming in, focusing more on new technologies and startups. So we're pretty happy about this, um, and we're we're definitely happy to be working closely with them. Um, and we think this is still early innings, and we want to make sure that um, the misperception of Africa and the potential growth coming from the bottom up in startups uh, is not, you know, told falsely. Um, but we definitely would love to kind of engage further with the ecosystem the Kyoto um, startups and corporates and public sector um, to really kind of bridge um, the two ecosystems going forward. So that's it from me about um, the Africa VC trends and some of the uh, activities from the Japan side that we are seeing uh, as we speak. And we hopefully, uh, we see a lot more potential to come going forward. So with this, we'd like to kind of hand it on to Yannick. We are very excited to have Anne from Africa Invest also, uh, Halim will be uh, joining from online, but I'll pass it on to you again. Thanks a lot, Ricky. Yes, as you said, so uh, we're lucky to have uh, Anne in Kyoto. Uh, thank you for coming all the way. And yes, so if you please, you may have a seat. Uh, Halim should be joining us uh, virtually. 
Um, he's in Japan. I can uh, confirm that, but uh, he's in Tokyo. Um, hopefully, we'll be able to get him uh, to see him online. Oh, hi. Hi, Halid. How are you? Can you hear Fine, us? Fine. How are you? Hi, everyone. Sorry for missing the event. Can everyone hear At least you? physically. All right, perfect. Thank you very much. So yeah, so it's going to be a great pleasure to be able to uh, interview both of them at the same time. And we're going to cover quite some ground here, but um, I think, uh, so I'll start from the very beginning. Khalid, this is your first time in Japan ever. It is. All right. So, but uh, uh, on the other hand, I think Anne uh, has been to Japan before. She has some kind of connection. So she might be, she might have some familiarity. Is that correct? You're coming. It's working. I hear you. Yes. Okay. No. Yes. It's all right. Yes. Um, so no, this is not my first time to Japan. I was here ten years ago. In fact, yes. Okay. Right. So um, I'll just give a quick overview of, of who our distinguished guests are today. So of course we have Ben. Um, sorry, Khaled Ben Jelani, who's senior partner at Africa Invest. Uh, he oversees the innovation team and the financial sector team. Uh, he joined in two thousand one and was involved in the structuring, fundraising, the management of three PE and VC investment funds and overseeing over 30 uh, investments across Africa, uh, innovative companies and in financial institutions. Uh, he's a startup activist, ecosystem activist uh, for simpler regulation. And we know that there's been a lot of a movement in Tunisia. Um, he's also an angel investor. Uh, he used to be an analyst at Barclays Bank, uh, working with Euro European payment systems and actually um, through his, a Tunisian venture, he developed a web payment system that is running in 18 African countries. So um, he, he, he's very able to understand and relate to the, the, the founders in Africa that are trying to do the same and follow in these footsteps. Um, and next to us here physically, we have Anne, who is senior officer at Africa Invest, and she, she's responsible uh, for client relations, uh, amongst other things. And uh, she's a globally recognized economic and geopolitical researcher and manager and uh, she has over two decades of experience in financial services and consulting. Uh, she worked as an economist, head of emerging markets research at Oak City and Nomura, which is this little connection that we mentioned previously. Um, and she also, she's also senior advisor at the Gatehouse Advisory Partners, so geopolitical consulting firm based out of London, which is why she's in between both jurisdictions. And uh, she's also a member of the board of the Tunisian American Enterprise Fund, uh, established by the US government to have stronger investment ties um, between Tunisia and local SMEs. Um, and uh, she's a graduate from the University of Pennsylvania and also has a master's from the uh, Columbia University, the School of International and Public Affairs. Thank you both for joining today. Um, uh, so, uh, you know what, I'll just kick it off and just um, maybe just build upon what makes this visit maybe different uh, and since it's uh, not your first time. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you all for welcoming here welcoming me here in this beautiful surroundings. This temple is phenomenal. I feel very lucky to be here. Um, what makes this time different? Well, first of all, I mentioned I had been here 10 years ago. 10 years ago, I was here in January. So it was a little bit different temperature than it is today. Um, so, uh, the, but, but joking aside, I think the, um, one of the, the big differences that I see from 10 years ago to now when we talk about Africa, uh, and I was talking about Africa then when I came uh, for uh, Nomura, and I was talking to investors then about investments into government bonds and into uh, government finance, because that was where the opportunity was at that point in time. Uh, fast forward 10 years today, and I think we see much more opportunity in private sector investments, certainly at the corporate level. Uh, and that is why I'm here with Africa Invest as we talk about all the opportunities that exist across the corporate space. The other interesting difference, I think, is that back 10 years ago, many of the problems or challenges that um, were being addressed in Africa were local. Uh, and today, the challenges that Africa faces are global challenges. They're ones that are faced by Japan, by the United States, whether it's climate change, whether it's disruption in supply chains, health issues, these are global issues. And so I think what's also interesting about today is that African corporates are thinking about the challenges they want to address in a global way, uh, much less uh, than, uh, you know, much, much less local than they were 10 years ago. 
That is so true, Anne, and thank you for putting that you know, in perspective. And I think as we learn more about African investors, some of you may know them as a leading Pan-African investment company, but they really describe themselves as a leading Pan-African platform. So uh, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll pass this question on to Halid and say, you know, what really makes it a platform and what, in your opinion, makes it leading in that sense? So we, we, we manage about uh, 18, 19 funds now uh, with different investment strategies. Um, and in order to do this, we've built basically common infrastructure for the different funds and different teams, whether in middle office and back office. And I think it's something that we, we, we that, that differentiate us from, from, from existing players today in Africa, that we've tried to build local presence in different regions in Africa. As uh, uh, Ricky was saying before, Africa is not only one continent is 54 countries, and these have very different business culture. Uh, and so we need to have a different presence into this through offices and through presence in these different uh, uh, location. Overall, we've invested into 180 companies. And something that I think we're doing well is to create networks between and links between these companies, whether locally, uh, regionally, but also internationally uh, with the companies in Japan, in Europe, in the US, to basically help these companies grow beyond their initial territories. All right, thank you. Uh, and also, so I understand that, oh, and you wanted to maybe add on to that, or, or was no, it was I, just me just, yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, because, so, so from what I understand also, so of course there is the, the VC component, but there's the PE component as well. So I was wondering if you could maybe touch upon how those differ uh, within your platform. Sure, um, I, I'll let Hamid take the VC piece, but for the for the PE um, space and kind of what makes African best different, um, Hamid mentioned the local networks. I think it's also a question of experience and longevity, right? Africa is a place that you need to know well and take time to get to know. Uh, and African Vest has been around for almost 30 years now, um, building and growing throughout that time. So uh, African Vest is a place that has invested in uh, almost 190 different companies across the continent. And as PE investors, we've also exited uh, more than half of those, meaning we've gone through the entire investment cycle of putting money to work, creating value in companies and then selling them on to new partners. Right, thank you very much. And so I think we can also tell, you mentioned the experience. Um, when we look at your list or your portfolio of investors uh, versus you know the, the startups, we can tell that it's, there's a lot of, uh, there's a good mix and also a lot of institutional investors. So I was wondering if you could you know, let us know, you know what is your investor portfolio mostly comprised of and why? Sure. Um, so those who have entrusted us with money for, for these 30 years, a lot of them are development finance institutions. So places that you would, you would know or be familiar with, whether it's um, the uh, International Finance Corporation, IFC, the African Development Bank, as well as quite a number of European development finance institutions. They have been with us since the very beginning in seeing a, an opportunity to really start up an ecosystem of investment, private equity investment. Over the years, as that, uh, those investments have performed well, we've been able to attract commercial investors as well. Uh, so those being uh, other uh, uh, insurance companies, pension funds, uh, the most interesting new additions to our investors now are actually African pension funds. So many African governments now are giving us money uh, to invest across the continent, which is just what you want for the development of a private equity ecosystem, for it to be self-financing within the continent as the private equity world is here in Japan, as the private equity world is in the United States or Europe, we're seeing that now increasingly happen in Africa, which gives us confidence for the long-term sustainability of that ecosystem. Yeah, thank you, and I think you know, there's a difference in terms of how you take care of investors on the PE side versus the VC, VC side. And so I want to throw this question to Halid in terms of, you know, looking at the high caliber investors that you're able to gather, how do you deliver, you know, value um, as to these investors and make sure that, you know, they're satisfied um, with the services you provide? So you no, know, a lot of us are engineers. So uh, so we like we like to make things in a consistent way, and so and so there's a lot of consistency in processes, 
but the first thing I think where we 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 add value to our portfolio companies in Africa is essentially governance. Uh, it's important first to set the stage for decision making to be to be done in the right way. And governance is a very important point in terms of putting in place the right structure uh, uh, for decision making and, and to define how the company will take decisions in the future. The, 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 the second thing is that we tried basically to share some of the values that have helped us either directly or through the other portfolio companies that we built into successes uh, to, to try to share those, those, those values with the, with the portfolio companies. And these are values essentially about integrity and professionalism. I think that we try to infuse those through basically the different projects, the different committees, the different interaction that we have with the, with the key managers of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of companies. The other point I mentioned before is basically try to build the network effect. Uh, so, so rather than basically try to have only us playing a role in the company, try actually to create an effect with our portfolio, but also with our investors, uh, with the corporate uh, 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 partners with whom we've built partnerships around different, uh, uh, different uh, uh, angles uh, and, and creating links between those specific portfolio companies and different ecosystem, open doors to them and build bridges to other, other continents is also something that we try to build in a, in a consistent way. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. And also because knowing that, you know, sometimes investors on the PE side and VC side, they require a different type of handholding um, I believe on the VC side is a lot more frequent, um, uh, but I guess um, maybe Anne, as, as, as an economist, I'd like to kind of get into more of the macro conversation. Um, Ricky mentioned some of those, but I think uh, it would be interesting to get your take in terms of what are some of these macro trends that you see and believe will be uh, some of the guiding leading forces um, now and in the near future. Sure. Um, well, maybe just to build uh, on the first macro comment that Ricky mentioned, which is the uh, African free trade area, which is just coming into effect, and we see as a an important opportunity for the continent. Um, as mentioned, you know, currently intra-African trade and collaboration is relatively low. There are many reasons for that. A lot of which has to do with infrastructure. Uh, but uh, this uh, arrangement, uh, which will take time to implement, but over time should see the economies of Africa much more integrated. And that provides opportunities across the spectrum. But what's interesting about Africa is that the corporates are not waiting for this to happen. This will be supportive of what corporates are already doing, what we're already doing at African Best, which is trying to create these networks across the continent, even before the governments do, whether that is taking our companies and expanding them from one region to another. Uh, now having a framework in place uh, that connects these uh, economies, I think will be a huge plus. Um, another macro trend or thing that we're seeing, uh, and this is, I, I referenced it in terms of the globe, um, is, is this terrible war that we're experiencing now in Ukraine, uh, which is creating challenges for the continent, particularly when it comes to supply chains. And that is um, compounding the challenges that many saw in supply chains during COVID. Uh, and what that means for the continent in terms of an opportunity is particularly when we look at Europe, they are seeing many opportunities to partner with Africa where they had once only seen those opportunities much further afield, whether it was in China or other places in Asia, there's a trend now towards thinking about how do we nearshore, how do we bring those supply chains in a little bit closer uh, and, the, and Africa stands to benefit from that. So it's the connections in Africa, it's the connections with Europe and the rest of the developed world. And then maybe the last point would be on climate, where I think there are huge opportunities for Africa. As we know, Africa is also very challenged by climate change, we all are, and Africa in particular whether it's um, you know, rising seas or rising temperatures, Africa is, is suffering uh, from, from uh, climate change, but also possesses much of the raw materials to be able to support new greener solutions, whether it's behind you know, all the minerals that go and, and, and the mining that's required behind solar panels and other renewable energies, uh, but also possesses vast areas uh, that are available for solar, wind, 
uh, hydro, there are huge opportunities in Africa to help the globe as we all address climate change. So I see that as another big opportunity as well. Yeah, thank you for sorry. thank you for um, walking us through this. And I was wondering, I'm going to throw this next question to Khalid. So uh, within this context, I was wondering, as Africa Invest, what are the the sectors in which you've been on which you've been focusing so far? And uh, you know, what are those that you believe may need or will see increased engagement? So listen, the, the, the sectors, the first sector, whether it's for private equity investment or, 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 or innovation, uh, is the financial sector. Uh, there's still a lot to be built in terms of basic infrastructure stack uh, uh, to offer basically basic uh, uh, financial services to companies, whether through traditional financial institutions or, 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 or fintech. But fintech is even becoming bigger now uh, because basically uh, still to that day, you only have less than 30% of the population have access to a formal bank account. You still have more than 99% of transactions that are being done by cash. And so there's a lot of needs, whether, whether, whether on fintech payments to provide basically uh, uh, payment uh, uh, services and products, whether in B2C, B2B, in, uh, in, in wholesale payments, there's a lot that is being built right now. And probably for the next 20 to 30 years, there still be a lot that will be built uh, in Africa in the payment space. Same into fintech lending. Um, you only have less than 20% of the population have access to uh, a formal credit. That means that you have 80% of the population to which you have to create new models to basically distribute them uh, and, and, and offer them uh, a credit through new approach using artificial intelligence and, and, and structured data sets. And so these are very interesting approaches that are being built right now uh, uh, and that have a lot of uh, uh, potential. On besides fintech, there's also uh, uh, education uh, where you have a very important growth from a de demographic standpoint. And basically the traditional approach to education cannot offer what Africans need in terms of educating their their, their, their children. Uh, and so EdTech provides for a lot of solutions and interesting approaches for, for this is probably the most under uh, uh, under uh, estimated uh, potential in terms of uh, uh, sectors in Africa right now. Healthcare is extremely important uh, uh, for the same basic reason as uh, as uh, as EdTech, but also because uh, uh, also Africa is a co is a continent that is aging and and, and need better healthcare services. Uh, mobility is very important. I think this is one of the sectors where we 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 are we are doing a lot of uh, interesting investment. And there's more. Uh, Actec, uh, I see like I see uh, uh, Sunda as a as a as startup that is into this uh, this uh, this sector. There's there, there's a lot happening right now in the Actec uh, uh, sectors. So these are all sectors specifically for innovation investment that are quite interesting. Uh, I can also give examples if uh, if there is any interest in uh, if you have more time at the end. Thank you very much, Tyler. And I think we were talking about this earlier, but there was one particular. Mobility was also one that we found interesting on our end, and I think Ricky, you had, when you were mentioning it, there was one that came from your mind. Yeah, no, I forgot to mention earlier, but already we're seeing kind of um, connections because um, Move, one of the investment portfolio companies, um, it's an asset financing mobility company, um, and Mitsubishi UFJ uh, just invested into them this uh, March, uh, in, uh, I think 105 million round or something. So I don't know. If, Mitsubishi, someone from Mitsubishi is here today, I thought maybe, but um, but there are these um, already kind of um, potential collaboration between other VCs as well, uh, VCs and other PEs as well. We, we, we did the absolutely right, Ricky. We did spend, uh, uh, we first we are investor into, into MOVE um, and uh, and we did spend some time with the uh, with the uh, Mitsubishi UFG team uh, in Johannesburg uh, uh, like a month ago or six weeks ago uh, when they were investing in uh, in uh, in move alongside us and this is I can uh, spend some time there but this is a company that is can change that started out of Nigeria providing loans to basically or or, or leasing uh, to uh, Uber drivers and other. Uh, ride hailing companies uh, and this model now is so successful has been so successful starting from africa that uber is using it also in other markets whether in the middle east in india in uh, in latin america but also in developed markets like in the uk where basically they're trying to push their drivers to use more electrical vehicle uh, because basically of the commitment that uber has been provided 
providing to uh, municipalities and uh, and and cities uh, to use basically cleaner energies and uh, and the the move is providing the link between basically the ride hailing platforms that Uber and other competitors have been developing with the capability of drivers to buy certain vehicles. And so this is a very interesting model that is becoming I think, uh, global starting from, from, from the African continent. Yeah, thank you for providing additional details about uh, the company. And so we have about like one minute left. So um, the last question, I'll actually let you decide who wants to take it on. But um, you mentioned a couple of the, in the investments that you've done, but if you could tell us about some of Africa Invest, um, you know, other successful initiatives um, that are part of your platform, since it's not just a VC that you do, um, if you could share those with us. Um, I will let Halit do that since I'm going to get a chance to speak again. <laughs> We have we have we have plenty of interesting ones in the payment space. For instance, we we've invested into a company called MFS. Um, you know, in 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 Africa, payment on the B two C side is is very fragmented. They have a lot of small operators, whether these are uh, telecom uh, operators that are creating wallets or private companies or private startups creating their own uh, basically private wallets, but they're not interconnected specifically for basically cross border transactions. And so MFS had been basically playing the role of a wholesale hub for all of these uh, these uh, these uh, these uh, these wallets wallets are becoming basically the new substitute for what bank accounts and credit cards have basically been for the majority of the people in developed markets and so this is extremely important and it's a company that is growing and doubling and tripling in size every uh, every 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 year they're now working on building also links between basically financial institutions in asia and uh, uh, their counterparts in uh, in uh, in uh, in Africa. So basically, facilitating cross-border transactions, essentially based on on trade. And so this is something that they're doing at the at the at the at the time. It's probably one of the companies with the biggest potential that we see in uh, in um, in uh, in Africa today in the payment uh, uh, space. We've also invested uh, uh, recently uh, into an edtech company called GoMyCode. Uh, this is a very young. Uh, founder that has started an interesting model, which is basically to provide young Africans with an ability to build digital skills uh, through basically a, a, a curricula that is not only fully online, not fully physical, but which is a hybrid uh, uh, approach, very scalable at the same time. Uh, this guy started in Tunisia. Uh, and is now in eight different markets in Africa uh, with, the, with, the, with revenues of three to four million dollars with the potential basically to multiply this by a factor of 10 to 20. Uh, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's also one of the probably most promising uh, companies in the education space in, uh, in, uh, in Africa. I will add one more, I have plenty, but I'll, I'll try to make a choice here. One more, uh, uh, which is basically um, 54 Gene. Uh, this is a company in the healthcare space uh, that has started basically to make, it's a, it's a company in the genomic space, and they, they start to map the African genome by basically collecting uh, DNA samples uh, in, in Africa. And the reason why this is important is that basically, if you look at all of the genetic mapping that's been done around the world, they've essentially been focused on developed markets. So essentially US, Asia, Japan, uh, uh, Europe, very few on Africa. While, while basically, if you look at, at the evolution of humanity, uh, uh, humanity started in Africa, and there's still 90% of basically of, of the genetic uh, 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 samples or, 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 or elements that are still staying into Africa, where basically there's no data about this, and the potential for basically for discoveries of genetic treatment is extremely important uh, uh, given that the fact that this is an untapped set of uh, of, uh, of DNA samples that exist on the on the on the on the continent so this company is now signing major partnerships with biotech companies essentially in the US for drug discovery and so this is one of the probably the most promising biotech companies on the continent that is starting right now yeah thank you Hali, for mentioning uh, 54 gene I have a 
fan myself of that company and following them for a while. So thank you for investing in them. Um, I think, um, so with that being said, you know, I think for those who aren't in attendance, don't worry, um, we'll be sharing documents that kind of cover some of the points that were discussed by our two distinguished guests today. So for you to sink your teeth into them a little bit more. Um, Khalid will still be around uh, for the startup presentations to provide some feedback to some of the founders. And of course, Anne will be here uh, physically for the networking session. We're excited to have you both this week in Japan, and we look forward to seeing you Helen, in person and uh, walking you through Tokyo about 17 plus meetings or so, 15 plus meetings, 18 meetings, um, fun days ahead. Um, and yes, yeah, so um, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you both. So uh, we're going to have a little health break, a uh, little break for everyone. And then after that, uh, until 4... 10. Also, 10 minute break if you need to go to the bathroom or freshen up, and then we'll be getting into uh, the panel discussion. Thank you very much. All right, 410 on the dot. Um, so we're back this time for the panel discussion. I was informed that we're a little bit out of um, um, late in terms of time, about 10 minutes, but uh, I think we'll have ample time to uncover many uh, topics of conversation here. Um, I was uh, supposed to do a long introduction for all of our guest distinguished uh, speakers, but I will just name them. Um, so of course, you're already familiar with Anne Wyman, uh, Senior Officer at uh, Africa Invest. Next to her, we have distinguished Dr. Uh, Usubi Sako, Professor, uh, I would say public figure actually in, uh, <laughs> in Kyoto. Uh, so, former president of um, Kyoto Seika University. Thank you for being here. Uh, and then we have Mr. Yoichi Yoshimura. Thank you very much. Uh, so managing partner at TriHard Investments. Uh, looking forward to your, your perspectives as well. And then we have Ms. Professor Tomoyuki Naito, uh, vice president of the Graduate School of Information Technology at the COVID Institute of Computing. So um, we're going to talk today about two things essentially. Um, so. Uh, Kyoto, the Kyoto ecosystem and business environments, whether from uh, startups, small businesses, um, Africa, of course, and how they're both connected and how we can potentially build on these connections. So we'll have different forms of different perspectives. But I would like to uh, maybe open the conversation with uh, Dr. Sako with, uh, because uh, you're very present um, when, whenever these, there's these conferences about Japan, Africa relations. So I know you can speak to this from many perspectives, but I would say, um, you know, more recently, based on what you've seen so far, is there anything that you've noted in particular that could be worth um, sharing uh, at this particular juncture? Um, okay, thank you. I mean, to invite me and then also to give me this opportunity. Um, I've been here, I mean, living in Kyoto for almost 30 years. So, um, I mean, this is my base, and as uh, you say in XA, so um, I've been observing the change um, of like, I mean, Kyoto climate uh, toward Africa. So the first thing is like, I mean, um, now we have um, a lot of young African uh, students, the researchers, and then that's uh, something very big because now I think uh, Kyoto is a really uh, interesting base for, I mean, uh, developing uh, the human resources for Africa. So, and the second thing is, as uh, uh, the startup uh, speaker also explained, the amount of universities, number of universities now are now starting to do a lot of like, I mean, connection with Africa. So I think Kyoto is something like, I mean, which is really giving us uh, an opportunity to understand that innovation is um, also a key concept uh, to, to develop like investment to also, I mean, help this African uh, leap for, you know, like a uh, tour, like digital also economics. And the second thing is uh, myself, I've been uh, building a platform uh, with um, African universities because I think um, investing uh, also like involving uh, ourselves to what is education is really also to involve um, ourselves into uh, African, uh, you know, uh, future. So now recently, I think Kyoto has been open to receive a lot of Africans, to support, you know, like a lot of young Africans, and also to connect, I think, Kyoto people, and also even this uh, new uh, business time to Africa. 
So that's what I've been observing recently. And I think like, I mean, um, it's a good move. And then um, I hope, I mean, uh, the connection uh, between Kyoto and Africa can be, uh, you know, between Japan in general and Africa. Thank you. That's the first step. Yeah. Thank you very much. And I think speaking about this young talent, these fresh young talents coming to expand their views and their knowledge in Japan, some of them staying here and others going back is a huge wealth that might be underappreciated within the conversation. But I was wondering, so these students who come to Kyoto, just thinking about what environment in which they evolve, what is the ecosystem in which they evolve? And I think uh, that Professor Naito can enlighten us from an ecosystem perspective, more of a structural perspective of what he sees, um, given also his position and, and the institution for which he works, um, if there are any um, observations on that point. All right, thanks very much. Um, first of all, um, thanks very much for inviting me to the, uh, this uh, very precious um, gathering. Um, my name is Tomiki Naito. I'm working for the other um, the Kobe Institute of Computing Graduate School of Information Technology. Then, um, in order to just uh, answer straight, um, the ecosystem, especially my field, which is the, the ICT and innovation ecosystem, um, she, Africa and Kyoto, I was really thinking how we can you know, connectively think about those two cities or the, those two areas. Africa, no wonder, very diverse, 54 countries. So as the previous speakers mentioned that, we cannot say Africa is Africa. Africa is very diverse. Africa is so different. But um, actually I was in Uganda six weeks, six weeks ago, uh, late May. That was the end of my uh, uh, three years, uh, the, travel after the uh, last travel was 2019. Then um, I reminded myself that Africa is really growing and changing dramatically, drastically and innovatively. Meaning is that the ecosystem of Africa is rapidly emerging. Meaning that infrastructure, especially for ICT, mobile, especially connectivity is expanding dramatically. I really surprised. I bought a smartphone in the capital city, the, the Kampara in Uganda. That was on, only 100 US dollar uh, made by China. Mm. But functionality of the smartphone, fantastic actually. Actually, when I drive seven hours drive from the Kampara city, the capital, seven hours, you can imagine, very local area, but still signal can be received. Mm. Then I can Google, I can search on the map. Then I just went to the other uh, destination very accurately. So what I want to say is that that kind of fundamentals, infrastructure, connectivity, and the, uh, the other related areas like uh, uh, mobile payment, Momo, which is managed by MTN, those kind of things are growing very rapidly, innovatively improving. On the other hand, Ecosystem require many different kinds of factors, including human resource development, financial instrument, government support, policy and regulation, and so on. Those are still left behind in some part. So if I think about the connection between Kyoto and Africa, for example, we really can start to think about how those two can supplement each other. So that is my actually really quick. Mm -hmm. Uh, thinking about this moment. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Naito. And so we'll circle back to that certainly. And so, because there is, of course, the, uh, I would say, the, the, the founder aspect, uh, the, the human resource element uh, that is part of the ecosystem and the key, the, the, the lifeblood of the ecosystem. But I think it's also important for people to understand um, the, the business environment when it comes to Kyoto um, and, and probably what's happening in the PE and investment space. Uh, and see how that also, uh, as part of the ecosystem, could be better connected between both worlds. But I think for us to get maybe a better understanding for us, um, actually, I don't come to Kyoto very often. I think Anne has been to Japan, maybe not Kyoto. So um, I was wondering if Yoshimura-san, if you could you know, share your views in terms of what, what you see Kyoto currently doing in that space and what could be encouraging. Okay, uh, my name is Yoichi Yoshimura. I'm 
uh, I'm going to say, uh, after my intro uh, introduction, that Kyoto is the best place for innovation in Japan. Okay, my back background is I, uh, you know, I'm a general partner of Midcap Private Equity uh, for 15 years. Prior to that, I was a consultant at McKinsey and Company, and, and prior to that, as uh, you mentioned, I, I was working for Sojitsu for more than 10 years, formerly mm -hmm. initial UI. So I'm a more like a business uh, uh, side of a uh, person. And uh, like some of you, I attended Waseda University and uh, Columbia University in the city of New York. And I did uh, five investments during uh, my 15 year experience. And uh, one of them is uh, was a, a manufacturing company, component manufacturing company in Kansai area. And uh, long story in short, uh, I spent uh, more than seven years as a CEO because our private equity is really hands-on. Then uh, we turned around and uh, developed some innovation, very innovative uh, products and uh, uh, successfully growth. And uh, at the end of the day, the crossover uh, m and So now it's a subsidiary of an American company. Then the, uh, you know, Kyoto, large Kyoto, Kyoto companies uh, like Kyocera, Omron, and Murata, and Nidec are all of our customers at that point. Then, but when, when I started, 80% of customers are Japanese large corporations, including, of course, all of them, as well as the Panasonic, Sony, and Pioneer, Sanyo, and some others. When I uh, resigned as a CEO, 80% uh, of uh, the customers are you know, uh, companies outside of the, the country, like Apple, Microsoft, Xiaomi, Huawei, Asus, and some uh, other you know, American and European companies. So that's the, the greatest point because and we, we kept the manufacturing operation actually within Japan and improving uh, productivity, uh, implementing Kaizen activities, uh, a thousand Kaizen activity a year mm. over the you know, seven, 10 years. So then now we make money from outside of the country. Then uh, we uh, increase the number of employees and uh, pay tax to Japanese government. That was uh, my uh, you know, great experience. And uh, what I want to say is those Kyoto companies, Kyocera, Omuro, Nairek, and Murata, uh, you know, they keep innovating uh, every year. They produce new products, new uh, technology almost every year. That's why they have been successful and they will be successful. Mm. So, uh, and uh, that's, that's why we, I respect those companies very well. So uh, this is a place innovation that's my message thank you very much and so and i'll get to you in a moment i just wanted to see because we had different perspectives here and i was just wondering in your view and this is for any of the three gentlemen how do you see the connection within the ecosystem between the corporate world that yoshimura san just mentioned versus the innovation happening in academia or the the institutes uh, that you work for and if you could comment on on, on those um, thank you very much. So um, during my uh, year of presidency at the university and also been, even before that, um, we, um, I mean, got a lot of occasion to uh, have a lot of like uh, what we call the collaborative classes, you know, with companies. And then in Kyoto is very common. So actually, you know, like, I mean, um, what call whatever company they do like, I mean, this kind of collaboration with the young people. So trying to even like, uh, uh, Put them in a in a real you know like I mean um, not uh, what do you say innovation project and then also try to even sell their products sometimes so we've been experiencing that and then that's also the good environment in Kyoto that you know young people they have opportunity to be you know directly involved into you know new you know like discovering or research or all those things and the second thing is this kind of platform in Kyoto is very interesting because 
we have also this kind of network of universities also. So which also make Kyoto, we are not like Boston yet, but I think, <laughs> I think Kyoto can pretend at a certain point to be like, because we have 38 universities here. So which is really huge. And then also if you add all the small universities around, it's 40 something. So I think like, I mean, that's a, a good base for young people. But, but uh, all your biggest problem now is those young people, well-trained, they don't stay, they don't remain in Kyoto. Tokyo, uh, you know, like uh, is coming to see them. So we are asking <laughs> Tokyo to let us, you know, uh, I mean, you know, enjoy our young people after university. Thank you. <laughs> Anything to add, uh, on those, uh, on those movements? I fully agree with Sako Sensei. Um, you know, um, I actually, as you kindly introduced me, um, I work for um, actually the uh, graduate school in Kobe. Kobe is the uh, one more plus uh, from here by train. Kobe is also the city of Kobe, uh, which was uh, famous for big port uh, city and uh, which was previously famous for one of the other. So most sophisticated city in Japan, but now totally different. Then the city of Kobe, we are actually I myself are um, she quite frequently discussing about you know, how we can uh, collaboratively solve the uh, issues in the city. The biggest issue is the people's outflow from the city, especially the young generation, as Sako Sensei mentioned. Once uh, even once the students learning university or high school or the graduate school in Kobe, they just flew away to Tokyo, Tokyo. <laughs> <laughs> or Osaka or the, even um, outside of Japan. That is fine. Actually, to me, that is fine. However, the point is, uh, if I come back to the context of Africa and the relation with Kyoto, no wonder Kyoto is the, the fantastic city, um, ancient capital and uh, um, um, sort of concentrated concentration of the, the academic. And as just as I mentioned, that city of innovation, I congratulate uh, Kyoto City is selected as a sad, uh, most in innovative city in Japan by the, the startup Geno. That is fantastic. But, 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 what I want to emphasize is that if the uh, you know, city of Kyoto or the prefecture of government of Kyoto or the big uh, organization company in Kyoto really want to connect uh, those developing emerging markets like Africa. Kyoto really have to open more to the, uh, the, those kind of very dynamic market. Sorry, I'm, I'm frankly speaking, mm. but the, the Kyoto is well behaved. Mm. Kyoto people very well behaved. That is fine, that is good. Mm. Africa, especially the, the uh, emerging market, Rwanda, Kenya, Tanzania, South Africa, Nigeria, or whatever, not necessarily well behaved. I mean, not the people, I mean, in terms of innovation, they are really dynamic and Africans. So if Kyoto want to collaborate with Africa, that kind of uh, emerging market, Kyoto can be more active, Kyoto can be more not well behaved type of mm. be more spontaneous approach. and yeah. more forward right. yes dynamic <laughs> right right so so now and i know that so you have the mind of an economist I, we've been feeding you a lot of information since you arrived in japan had some wonderful perspectives that were shared right now so thinking about from the outside in and you wanting to bring more of africa how do you see some of these pieces coming together well, one observation from this panel um, is I find it remarkable. One of the things that in Africa we worry about is people leaving Africa, our bright young people leaving Africa. And to hear it from Kyoto, you too, saying, what do we, we develop great people, we have great innovators and they go somewhere else. One thought is why are we not creating some circular economy and we can send some of the Africans here, um, even if there are those that leave. In the end, we should want, as an economist, we would want this 
free trade of people, if you will, um, the dynamic people go where they're most needed and where those startups are. So fantastic, uh, you know, that you have um, so many bright young Africans coming here. Wouldn't it be great if they if they stayed on, even if it meant that some of the people from Kyoto moved to Tokyo and other places? Um, I agree, it requires a dynamism and an openness on all, all sides, right? It's not a common, and I'm sure you, you're quite familiar with this, it's not so common that Africans will choose or think about coming to Japan, but that doesn't mean that it isn't something that we can't continue to develop. And my being here today and this discussion is very much a part of spreading that word of Japan's openness, the invitation that you all have greatly extended to us as African best, as, you know, sitting in Africa, even though I personally am not African, I benefit from these open borders. I'm American born and bred, but spend more than half my life in Africa. And uh, I think the richer for it. And I think to the extent that we can continue to expand those borders between Africa and Japan, everyone is, is the richer on both sides, uh, no matter which direction they're going. I think this is a great point, and I think it goes down to making sure that some of the, I would say, structural elements are there to make sure that things function both ways and that, you know, there, there are uh, ways that both sides could benefit, sometimes in different ways from the flows, but that there's this circular element to it. Yes, I think the other observation, too, and it's a remark that I made in my own comments about moving one step beyond uh, government to private sector is that oftentimes the private sector can help to make this happen. Government is needed to enable the private sector, uh, but then the private sector finds the opportunities and runs with them. So I think that collaboration, I think it's lovely that Kyoto City is part of this cooperation today and we're grateful for that. And there is a government element to enabling then the private sector to be able to have these conversations. That's a great point. So maybe Yoshimura I was wondering, um, if you could speak within your length of experience, uh, some of the, the interactions or support that you've had uh, from a public private perspective and how that has helped and vitalized or revitalized to some, at some point um, the economy in Kyoto. Um, uh, what were some of the things that stood out for you from that collaboration? Okay, if I you know, talk about, you know, relatively small early stage young companies uh, in Japan, I think I can share two stories. Uh, one is debt financing from uh, regional uh, banks. I, uh, last week, I talked to one of the uh, regional banks uh, in Osaka area, and they're trying to uh, implement debt finance to young, young companies. And I asked, okay, what percent of uh, your uh, track record is from Kansai area, including Kyoto? Mm. They said, 10%. Uh, uh, and uh, really, that's good, good enough, I said. Mm -hmm. They said, no, no, actually, it's like five, six percent. So that indicates 90 percent of new businesses is uh, developed in Tokyo. Right? Then uh, we are in, in Kansai area, we are still less than 10 percent, I guess. Mm -hmm. So we have uh, uh, a lot of improvement opportunities. <laughs> That's a positive idea, right? Mm -hmm. That's uh, uh, how our private sector and public sector need to help, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Kyoto companies. And second thing is hiring. And it is very difficult to hire CFO with CPA background, for example, in Kansai area, mm -hmm. because everybody is in Tokyo. But it's really, relatively easier to hire software engineers in uh, Kansai area, because many of them want to stick in uh, Kyoto, Osaka, Kobe. Uh, I, I know, as far as they don't really want to work for uh, Yahoo or Mercari or other, you know, mega ventures. They want to find something interesting in this area. Mm -hmm. So that helps a lot for uh, startups, uh, early companies in Kyoto and other Kansai areas. That's also a, you know, a good opportunity. Thank you very much for sharing that view. And uh, you know, my, my question maybe would go to um, you know, Naito, Naito Sensei in terms of, so we spoke about the founders uh, who build these companies and finding the talent or people with the talent either going to different cities. Um, 
What are some of the things that you've seen um, structurally in Kyoto, at least, that were put in place to at least try to foster the talent uh, domestically or either um, make sure that they're trained in order to address some of the needs that were raised by Yoshimura-san in terms of um, having more qualified CFOs or all these pieces that are essential to build a company? I mean, if, for example, if I start a company in Kyoto, for example, well, yeah, that's a very good question. Um, as, yeah, actually, Yashima is really making a point. Um, in my school, in my graduate school, uh, roughly 30% of the graduate school students are uh, coming from Africa and Asia, many countries, different countries. Others are coming from other countries, and the other 30% are from Japan original. Then, many of them, apart from the other, uh, government officials coming from by the uh, national government support scarcely. Many of them are suffering from the actually, employment issue in Japan after graduate. Mm. Then uh, if I come back to your question, if someone operate the, the uh, small farm or the small and medium farm in Japan who really require the software engineer, actually, there are a lot of opportunities existing in this area, Kyoto, Osaka, and Kobe. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, in the reality, the students, student side, they are really looking at the longer term opportunity as well. They really need some stable income, monthly income, or the, some uh, career development plan and so on. So there are some area of mismatch in between the hiring uh, operation and the student side. So uh, education wise, we are providing the education or the skills which can be matched with the other Japanese company's requirement, if I'm clever. But uh, there is a big issue, which is a Japanese speaking requirement mm. that is still existing a lot in Japan. Many actually over ninety five percent of the Japanese companies still requiring Japanese speaking, Japanese writing, Japanese reading skills. So actually, without break through that kind of uh, you know, barriers, Japanese company cannot go beyond further. Uh, and the student side uh, still uh, to keep suffering from that kind of. You know, difficult issues, then those mismatch will continue. So that, that is a existing issue, that is a reality. Very complex issue, of course. Yeah, uh, I think what you say is right, but uh, um, one thing is um, in Japan uh, or in Kyoto, I think Africa is still invisible actually. I mean, people are not still, uh, you know, understanding or they don't have enough information about what can be done in Africa, what can be, uh, you know, the potentialities because they are always taking the problems. But in Africa, we are turning the problems into, into opportunities. So that's something very important in Africa. But at the same thing, I mean, um, I don't know if you, you know that uh, we, we have now more than uh, 300 uh, Africans here. Now we organize ourselves into a community, I mean, a group, I mean, African diaspora, I mean, in Japan here. And then now people are starting to connect themselves to Africa and also to Japanese company which are investing in Africa. So I think African, I mean, uh, students or scholars here, they can be a kind of like, I mean, economical bridge between those companies and then also Africa. I think that's, I mean, a new uh, thing which is starting not from Japan side, but from African. They think that, okay, we have this opportunity to be in Japan, we should do something. And the other thing is, so um, what I initiate now, um, I initiate a program to send uh, students to Africa. I mean, for a, a long-term program, six months, they can stay there, they can new, those people can be the ambassador of Africa when they come back to talk about what can be you know, done in Africa. I think maybe in 10 or 20 years, Japanese students will start to uh, look for job outside of Japan. And then Africa is an opportunity. So that's something which should really continue to promote, even in our education uh, field. Thank you very much. Yes, it's about switching the narrative and thinking more solutions and opportunities 
And speaking of which, and I've, I've been told that we have about less around three, two minutes left. Speaking of opportunities, um, we do have African investors who came over for reasons. And so I was wondering if you could maybe share maybe some of these, in your view, what are some of these opportunities uh, that could be potentially capitalized upon by either Japanese investors or, you know, companies? What do you think? Sure. Yeah, I think we hit on some of those with with the interview with with Khalid and 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 myself. I think there are many opportunities uh, when you look in the services sector across Africa, whether that is in health services, education services, uh, all kinds of business processing out services. There are many opportunities because there are there is. Uh, you know, the, the, the African demographics are the flip side of the Japanese de demographics. Mm -hmm. We are a very young population. Uh, and so there are a lot of highly employable people looking for jobs that have been educated, um, but are looking for opportunities and services is an area where many people um, can, uh, I think, can excel. What's interesting and, and underlying a lot of what this discussion today is that the world we live in allows connectivity beyond just a physical presence. So thinking about Africa as a place for outsourcing, I, 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 as I commented about supply chains, which actually we're thinking about getting closer to Europe physically for goods. But when it comes to services, services are global. Many of them are accessible from far distances, whether that's you know, providing healthcare services to Africans, um, you can be in the next town over or you can be in Japan. Um, it doesn't really matter once you're talking about telemedicine. Uh, same thing when you're talking about financial services. Financial services have an element that, don't re that doesn't require physical presence. So to me, when I think about Japanese African links, in many cases, it's thinking outside of the box where virtual, where, dis where that distance, which is one of the things that has kept the two places so far apart, can be erased completely we you know we had Khalid here with us he happens to be in Tokyo but he could have been in Uganda or he could have been in Tunisia or somewhere else uh, because we now have this capability so I think thinking about that virtual mm -hmm. connection mm -hmm. uh, particularly in the services space and educate we talked about education and financial services mm -hmm. here but I would add health to that as mm -hmm. well um, as great opportunities I'd like to double down on that question just as a last thought what are some of the connections that Africa Invests would be interested in making while you're in Japan? So in in um, in Japan, I think the meetings that we're having are a range of different kind of meetings. Whether they're looking for LPs or investors who would be investing in our funds, we are looking for companies that would be interested in buying some of the companies that we've invested in, and then we uh, then we sell them on. We are looking for co-investors, so people who would come alongside with us in investments that we're making in the continent and add a Japanese angle. Um, I think there are many opportunities for Japanese to get involved if they do it with African Invest. Um, there are a lot of different ways that we can we can connect, and we also are deeply embedded in the ecosystem, even in education. So I think you know some of the the comments that I've heard about education. Aside from just the investing we do, we actually support education across the continent. We are a supporter of as part of our um, social responsibility of a, 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 an organization called Open Startup, OST, which actually educates university individuals in um, Africa, started in Tunisia, but is now in uh, across North Africa, getting people excited about entrepreneurship. They, they are in every domain, whether they're, we bring in um, and, and help OST support people in medicine, in finance, in engineering, bring them together and teach them how to be entrepreneurs. And then they can use the technical skills that they have. Um, so I think there's a lot of collaboration that can go on um, and we look forward to it. And that is, on that note, that's great because it happened, there it turns out to be a networking moment mm -hmm. at the end after we get to start to the start presentation. So I hope that we get to continue some of these conversations. Um, thank you very much to all our partners for sharing their thoughts from this perspectives.
And uh, we have, we do have another break before the start of presentations. However, we'll make it shorter to, well, about se seven, eight minutes instead of 10. Sorry for cutting uh, two minutes away, but we just want to respect, uh, be respectful of everyone's time. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. All right. So um, for the final portion of today's events, excluding uh, the networking uh, session, we're going to get into the Kyoto startup uh, presentations. And um, our first startup is actually joining us from Uganda. Um, so it's Ms. Aya Tsuboi. So the co-founder of Sunda Technology, uh, Sunda Technology Global, obviously, because you're in a different part of the world. Um, so how the presentation will go is there'll be five minutes to pitch, followed by five minutes Q&A. Don't be shy. If you have any questions, please feel free to uh, do so. So, um, Ms. Tsuboi, um, I'll pass it on over to you. Hi, good morning and good afternoon, everyone. I, I hope I, you can hear me very well. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, okay. And also you can see me my slide. Yes, we can. Okay, thank you. So thank you again. And also thank you. Thank you for allowing me to join this event uh, from Uganda remotely. And I am Aya, founder of Sunda, and I'm working in Uganda, especially for now. And I'm based in Kampala. And my co-founders uh, co are there, like Uganda engineers, two engineers. So Sunda is an automated system of collecting contri community contributions for hand pumps in rural area. Let me go to the next slide. And our focus is water issue in sub-Saharan Africa, especially in rural area. As you can see this chart, uh, sub-Saharan Africa is the place having the biggest population, having limited access to safe water. And the worst thing is if you compare 2000 and 2017, the situation is not changing so much. So we can easily understand that we cannot achieve SDGs goal number six by 2030. So we want to solve this uh, bottleneck issue of this challenge. And the left chart is showing how people access safe water or not safe water in rural Uganda. So half of the people uh, rely on hand pumps. Uh, I hope you have the idea of what is hand pump. And hand pump is a water facility uh, getting water from the ground uh, by pumping by people, not like using electronic or automated pump. So this so facility is shared by community around 500 people or sometimes 1000 people. And this hand pump is installed by government or aid agency or NGOs, but once they install, community needs to maintain by themselves. Uh, so they need to collect enough contributions from house by house and uh, keep it and use it for like buying spare parts or uh, paying for, for like hand pump mechanic to work on repairing hand pump once it's breaking down. But unfortunately, this has been failed for a long time, more than like 20 years. And this causes long downtime of this hand pump. So of course, during the downtime of the hump to hand pump, people cannot access safe water. So they need to go to swamp, uh, which is used by also animals, and that is not good at all. So the biggest challenge of that is like collecting enough contributions from house by house, and that is the, the very difficult. So why? Uh, it is because like sometimes it has security issues because they are collecting by cash and cash sometimes disappear. <laughs> and also uh, the payment is unfair because uh, some people pay, some people don't pay, but people can use water like uh, 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 when the hand pump is working. Yeah, that's kind of thing is the background. And uh, this is how soon the unit is looks, looks like. And there's an uh, existing hand pump and we install additional orange box. This is our product. And also we have solar panel and battery to power the whole system. And the people use ID tag to get water. So in the orange box, we have like RFID tag reader and also water meter, bulb and motherboard to operate the whole system, then module to connect internet. 
So this system is uh, connected to data server. Uh, so that's uh, we can see the water usage at real time and from anywhere. And this is more details. So when we install this orange box on the existing hand pump, we distribute ID tag to each, ha each household for free. Then this user can pay or charge uh, their water on their ID tag by their mobile money. Then after that, they can bring the ID tag and insert into orange box. And this orange box can identify who I, who I am and also the, uh, it can identify the balance of the water so they can fetch water accordingly. And so far, uh, we have installed 67 units of Sunda system in Uganda. So uh, more than 30,000 people are using Sunda system and access safe water uh, all the time. And also we have collaboration with JICA and also we have MOU with Ministry of Water and Environment of Uganda uh, to expand this system uh, to the whole of Uganda, like 45,000 systems by like uh, 2030. And we have two kinds of uh, uh, revenue. So one is initial investment. Uh, we are expecting from like developing partners or government and also we have uh, like commissions, uh, which uh, some percentage of uh, what community, what people pay for water, for water. So that is the two revenues. Uh, so uh, we are in 2020, 2022, and we are targeting 200 units uh, to demonstrate in the, the one district. Then uh, we, uh, we are trying to reach to the whole Uganda, and also we are trying to reach other African countries to solve water issues in the, the whole African continent. Uh, so, um, so far we have uh, uh, the units and installed, and we confirm the needs of the end users, but still uh, we need some steps to achieve that goal. And so we have, we need, uh, we are now looking for technical support and also like investment of uh, 300,000 US stars for 200 units demonstrations and also trials in other regions. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you very much, Roshana. Thank you for the presentation. So it was just a little bit over five minutes, but we still have uh, about three minutes and a half for the Q and A. So uh, first what I'll do is maybe open the floor if there's anyone who has an immediate question. I believe there's a microphone there. So if someone has a question. I also a reminder that uh, Khaled is also online. So if he has any advice um, for uh, the founder, that would be also uh, appreciated. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Yannick. Uh, yeah, thank you for the, the, the presentation. I have two quick questions uh, first. Can you, can you elaborate a bit more on the, on the revenue model? Do you, do you sell the pump? Or do you get a percent on basically the revenue generated or the the uh, the usage of the pump? And also about your distribution model, how how are you distributing? How are you reaching to local communities with your products? And uh, and how much time does it take basically to install the pump? Okay, our so uh, at this moment, like developing partners like energy or like NGOs or JICA uh, is buying the product itself as an initial cost. So they can install uh, our systems on the existing hand pumps by, by themselves. Okay. And af yes, after installation, so communities like water users are paying water fee through Sunda units to like operation and maintenance providers, which is uh, responsible for maintaining all the hand pumps in this area. Like for example, one district has one o and m provider and one district has like two, 200 or 300 hand pumps. So this one uh, is getting a money, is getting revenue from communities through the uh, through Sunda unit but uh, we take some percentage of this collection as commission. Uh, okay. And, and how, how much does a, cost, a, a pump cost for the community? Uh, so initial cost of this unit is 1,000 US dollars. Okay. 
Yes, but yeah, of course there is required another hand cost for hand pump installation. Very clear. Any question in the public so that I yes, don't take all do. the time? Yes, I do have, oh, and would you like to? I have. Yeah, thank you for the presentation. I just had a quick question about um, security of the, the the unit itself. How do you ensure that it is it remains where you installed it? Uh, so we have a uh, very few vandalized in the field actually, uh, but we are still improving the units uh, to make more like stronger than for, from the vandalism. And also we are in collaborating with government or like district people or like police or that kind of uh, communities to, to have better security in the field. Thank you. And so maybe one last question. So you mentioned that so that you wanted to expand. I was wondering, are you using the exact same model to expand? Meaning that are you going through JICA or other NGOs to expand into other markets? Uh, so if I, if I am in Uganda, we, I can directly reach uh, developing partners like JICA or like, like NGOs. But in the future to other countries, so we can just distribute our product to to like distributors in other countries. Like it just looks like other like product. Okay, understood. So they can, yeah. Mm -hmm. yes. Thank you very much. So I think we're out of time, but thank you so one, much. One, one last, one last comment. Uh, no, go just, ahead. just yeah. I, uh, the model that has been working well because one thousand five hundred dollars for local community may be a bit high uh, as a as a as a price point. Um, and one model that has been working well, and we've seen it, for instance, in, in, in Kenya, but also in Uganda, which is a pay-as-you-go model, where basically you pre-finance your, 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 uh, the, the acquisition through, through, through debt, and then you have a payment over time that come as a micro-lease, and basically that helps uh, uh, communities, rather than paying upfront for the, uh, for, the, uh, uh, for the unit, it pays it over 12 or 18 months. And, and, and so th that way, basically, the price point is much lower, and that gets basically to have a much, much uh, easier distribution, I would say, of your, of your units. Anyway, that was just one comment. And I can give you examples, if you want, offline of people who are doing this in the irrigation space. Uh, that's been, been working extremely well. Uh, OK, thank you for the comment. Also, we have that idea, but because of the hand pump, the actual revenue from the community itself is very low. So that's why uh, we are requiring some support yeah. from the, the initial reports from external sources. Understood. Mm. Thank you very much uh, for, for the comments. That is really on point. And uh, great presentation, Aya. Thank you so much. And uh, yeah, hopefully we hope to see you in Uganda when we, tra when we travel to, to Africa. All right. Thank you very much. All right, great. So uh, great presentation. Um, so the next uh, presenter is uh, Mr. Masanori Onishi, uh, co-founder of Deep Forest Technology. So just, um, I'll, I'll give you a sign. So some, how would you like me to indicate so when you have one minute left i'll just try to make one movement so you can see when you have one minute left for the presentation oh, okay yeah. and you can go a little bit over but just to let you know so uh the floor is yours yeah. okay i will uh, welcome to Kyoto. I'm Masanori Onishi, CEO of Deforest Technologies Company. Today, I would like to present our solutions for the forest conservation using UAV and artificial intelligence. So this is the content of today's presentation. First, I will share our company information. Our company is founded in March of this year. Now it is a small company, but we are the startup from Kyoto University. I am an engineer with 
PhD of Kyoto University. Especially, I am PhD in forestry. So let me explain what we are working on. The social challenges we are focusing on is deforestation and forest degradation of tropical forests. Deforestation in the tropics still continues and the whole world needs to come up with a solution. While I was a student and a researcher at Kyoto University, I went to Bornean tropical rainforest to find solution from fields. In the research, we measured carbon stocks and biodiversity at field while I was stunned by bees and had my survey equipment destroyed by elephants. Oh. <laughs> Here we should think, why does deforestation happen? Simply because it is profitable. In other words, deforestation is caused by economic aspects. To solve deforestation from an economic aspect, a profitable system through forest conservation has been created. Carbon absorbed through forest conservation can be traded in the form of carbon credit. Red Plus is worth J credit in Japan and voluntary market which purchases by private companies are expanding. The challenge here is then how to monitor and evaluate carbon stocks and soundness including biodiversity. There are many challenges such as lack of experts, difficulty of access to forests, many cross surveys and regular surveys are needed. After all, conservation also requires much cost and labors. Under such situation, UAVs are expected to be helpful. There are three steps to utilizing UAVs in forests. The first two of these, UAV flight and image processing are now available to everyone to some extent due to the widespread use of software. However, the last step of visualizing first information is technically immature and no software exists that can do this. In other words, if we can create software for the last step, then anyone can fly UAV to estimate the carbon stocks. This could then be used for red plus and carbon markets, which could lead to forest conservation. This is our solution. UF scanner, which is software specialized for first analysis from UAVs, UAV data. This software allows analysis of tree species and size estimation at each tree level and estimation of carbon stocks and biodiversity. Thus, the software will enable more efficient forest management and forestry while at the same time enabling forest conservation through the visualization of forest values. The court, oh, sorry. This software has already been released. However, only a portion of the planned development has been successfully completed. And the current level is mainly for use in planted conifer forests. We will continue to develop the system so that it can be used in the tropics and aim to make it the world's most advanced and standard UAV forest analysis tool, just like Microsoft for computer. The core technology behind our company and software is a technology I developed for the first time in the world at Kyoto University that uses artificial intelligence to enable identification of tree species from UAV digital images. This technology is the most advanced in the world and our company has a great advantage because three species is the information needed for estimation of carbon stock and biodiversity estimation. We will continue to bring technology to society for the conservation of forests and the sustainable future. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you, right on time. Um, so I'll open, first of all, the floor. Um, he framed it as an economic problem. So I don't know if, <laughs> and his mind is, is jotted your, jog, start jogging your mind. Economic, but also business. I, I'm interested who your prospective customers would be for this um, product. Okay, the customer is the first managers. For example, 
local first managers, first story company, and first story agency. They are the customers of our software. Our software, our software has a feature that the analysis can be used for the normal UAV, normal drone. So everyone can use this software for analysis in the world. So the customer is uh, people who, um, who has, uh, um, who, yeah, who has a forest or who are doing the forestry in the world. Um, just want to check real quick if the Hyatt has a yes. One question here. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, can you can you can you explain what what your revenue model is here? I mean, who will have to pay for the software and uh, and on what basis? Okay, so the business model and the customer. Okay, and this is the cash flow of the our company and the main uh, the main earnings of earnings is software in Japan and also software in overseas. The price of the software is subscription and the price 1 million yen. This is the uh, price for the developed com uh, company for the developed country. And the, and the consumer is the first manager and first agencies of all over the world. And just for context, so 1 million yen uh, in US dollars would be around 7,500, at least it's low yen. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. Sorry. In low yen, for you, so yeah. Uh, did I answer your question, Hari? Yeah, yeah, it did. No, thank you. Thank you. And so, um, so you said that you were the first in the world to develop this software. Um, so is, did you look into some of the compatibility with some of the existing software that's currently being used? Is it something that would be easily plugged into other existing software? How do you see that integrating the current um, market? Yeah, okay. And uh, current market is, um, the forest manage management is conducted by the field, check every trees. So, I want to change from there to here to the digital transformation. And uh, there are um, no same software in the world. And there's some company, some company do the service for a flying drone and uh, estimate, us, for example, carbon stocks. And that is one business. But in our model, I want to. Um, give this software to anyone and anyone can fly drone and can analyze this by themselves. So now the company is um, just established and released, but some, for example, some uh, drone companies and some uh, the com private company, which has a forest uh, giving us to the demand for this software. Have you spoken to for other forest managers and can you tell us how are they excited? What's their reaction to the yeah. possibility of the product? Yes, yes, yes. So this software is has a, mm, I think this is really good software mm -hmm. <laughs> and a good solution for the, you know, those companies and those customers, I think. Yeah, thank you. I guess it's more like a VC type of question, but I, I guess, um, are you looking to raise, have you fundraised? What's your kind of um, plan for the next year or two? I think you found the product market fit. Um, so what's your kind of plan going forward? Yeah, uh, our plan is uh, at first, uh, we will sell this software in Japan. And after that, I will do the overseas. And for that, we will uh, gain the fund from the venture capitals, and we will uh, to go to the IPOs in 2027.
maybe just like a follow-on question, sorry. Um, but given, you know, you, you're, I think this is a great example of a technology company coming out of a university. How has been your kind of support from the university, maybe even the public sector, including the government and municipals? Okay, and last year, the Kyoto University funded us to make this software and some support. And after that, and now I'm collaborating with Kyoto University's uh, laboratories and also the Kyoto city and Kyoto prefecture supported me to these uh, events or uh, introduce some companies or venture capitalists. Thank you very much. Ms. Maybe Thank one last you. comment uh, uh, here. Yes, uh, hi. We, we've invested in a company called Aerobotics, which does uh, similar things, but essentially for uh, growers of, uh, of uh, tree crops. Uh, uh, around the world, and and so and so similar software based essentially on 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 drone pictures, and and we learned two things through this company. The first thing is that uh, flying drones is expensive, and a lot of the um, a lot of the uh, of the of the growers uh, uh, do not want basically to pay for that cost, and so we had to basically migrate the software to satellite uh, uh, pictures. It took some time, it took like two years to get there, but it's, uh, it's now uh, stable on, on satellite pictures, especially satellite pictures are, get, are, getting, are getting better and better. So you can basically use basically AI on those, uh, on those pictures. The second thing is that growers uh, uh, are not very tech savvy users. And so to sell them software takes a lot of time. And uh, and requires to go into bars and meet with them and explain the the, the upsides, and and so the, the population that we found was pretty much uh, much more savvy for this kind of software are insurance companies that are insuring the growers or the forestry operators, and those basically like way more the type of data that this software can actually produce. And this is just lessons learned from basically spending a few years in a, in a company that is doing something very similar to what you do. Oh, thank you for the comment. And I'm sorry, I do not understand all of your comments, but uh, especially the cost of the, this software and drone and uh, flying drone, software for the flying drone is yeah, expensive, especially for the, I think, developed, uh, developing countries. So um, maybe it is a little bit difficult to install those softwares to the forest management in developing countries. But um, in the future, the um, forest management system is, I think, the using drones and using those software is be standard, will be standard, I think. Yes, sorry, thank you very much. And I think your plan is kind of long-term grow in Japan and then see how things turn out globally. So thank you very much for uh, your, your presentation. Great Q&A. And um, just a reminder that tea will be served uh, by the temple at 5.30. So there might be some movement going on, uh, but at the same time, we wanna make sure that the startups have time to present. So uh, thank you so much. Thank you very much. So uh, the third presenter is Mr. Patrick Ocheza. Um, and so he's a blockchain researcher at Kyoto University. Thank you, Patrick. So uh, just, I will flag if you have like a minute left. So. Okay. Thank you very much uh, for coming to, the, to today's event and thank you for visiting Japan and I hope you will enjoy my presentation. So I'm Patrick from Kyoto University and I've been working on this research on blockchain education um, for the past five years from master's program now to the PhD which I'll be running up soon. So it's, on, it's called a tree chain where we connect education data on the blockchain. So to give a background to this problem, So we are familiar with education. There's currently a transition from in-class um, teaching style to online-based learning. And given COVID-19 pandemic, it's even more urgent for us to make such transitions. So for such tech-enhanced based education, we are seeing platforms like MOOCs, massive open online courses, learning management systems, 
And these various technology tools result in vast amounts of data, which has led to a potential for data-driven education, where we get to know more about the learner, personalize for their specific needs, and help them achieve their learning goals faster. But there is a fundamental problem. So when learners learn, they typically move from one school to the other. But as they make this transition, for instance, from primary education to junior high school, then high school, and then college, their learning data does not go with them. So this typically causes cause problems like schools not being able, to, being able to know what the learner need, connect their learning records, or even personalize for specific needs. So here we pr propose a solution where schools can be on a single network where they can exchange data and information of their student, of course, in a privacy protected scenario. Where students, where, for instance, in this example here, a student called Anne might exist on uh, multiple systems, let's say uh, school A and university B, but their accounts here are not connected. So we're proposing a technology where we can use the blockchain to have a single user account across the education network such that if I school in, in university in Nigeria and I move to Japan, I don't need to do much of paperwork to move my transcript, to move all the data, all the files to all the schools I want to go. Simply Kyoto University will come to the blockchain and say, hey, Patrick has given me authorization. Can you pass on their credentials to Kyoto University? And through the blockchain, we can facilitate such transfers. So to do this, we have built a proprietary blockchain system that uses smart contracts to facilitate privacy and protect learning records of um, learners. So the big picture is basically, currently, we have an academic system where people move from early childhood education to compulsory education, tertiary, and then adult education. We want to be able to connect their lifelong learning such that at every stage in life, they could reflect back on what they have done, use the information to inform their next action. So we want to have a lifelong learning blockchain that can support learners in their learning journey. So for us, the proprietary of what we have done so far is a novel blockchain for education data. And within our research group, we've got knowledge on connecting this data and using, uh, providing analytics tools that learners can use to derive insights from this data. And then also, this is the first decentralized and interoperable blockchain for education data and analytics. So by this, we mean that across different schools, you don't need to worry about you uh, paying the cost of gathering the data or collecting the data. We use a decentralized analytics platform to make this analysis possible and report insights to either the student or the teachers who support uh, these learners. So the business model for the free chain platform is basically we want to be an open source software because since it's blockchain, we want to be able to have a community support where we try to improve the security. And also over time, we can have more parties or more collaboration across the schools that we adopted. And then the free chain platform we provided as a software as a service like uh, for instance, the Dropbox, where we can have model for people who are worried about their data. Maybe the schools may disappear. They could subscribe to the service where we provide storage for their data across different schools. And then they could also subscribe to say, okay, I want to get a job in so XYZ company. What do I need to do to provide such kind of services on their trade platform? So there's a B2B side of it where we work with institutions, uh, like in the current setup in, uh, in our research group, we work with some certain schools in, in, in Japan who use our platform to provide learning to their students. So through those data we collect, we provide insights back to the teachers and then to support the students as well. From the B2C context, it's more like, like I mentioned before, a cloud storage service or a learning analytics support service or a recommendation service for HR executives that want to uh, maybe recruit the best of talent that fits their company culture. Of course, in all this mix, students have to give permission on the blockchain or subscribe to such services. So for monetization, We've got um, this learning analytics service platform which we recently proposed and was accepted in an education uh, conference, basically where we have services uh, that can use the data and learners can visualize the results of those services. So we have the service providers, the network, and then the users. So uh, also we want to have enable learners to have a lifelong learning portfolio, which can help them in their job search. And also employers can find based on company culture and then data backup and transfer uh, services. So this is some of the research papers, uh, some of the key ones that we've done over the past five years. And we are currently working with some schools, like I mentioned, and we are driving this uh, initiative uh, in, support, in line with uh, some of the uh, directives we are getting from the government, such as the Giga School Project, where different schools, uh, being, uh, schools across Japan are encouraged to use ICTs 
and then their data co collection points. So we want to be able to use such system to exchange data and analytics across uh, these different uh, entities. Also, thank you very much. And that's my presentation. Thank you very much, Patrick. That's a great presentation. So for the Q&A, uh, since we have six minutes, we'll try to keep it at four uh, minutes. So first I'll ask, uh, and you, you have a question? Sure. Um, I think it's one of the same questions we've asked uh, some of the previous presenters about your revenue model and what your plans are um, in terms of fundraising and then uh, how you plan to grow. Okay. Thank you very much. So at the current stage, um, we are trying to commercialize the product from research to into a product that uh, businesses can use. But now what we are doing more of is like uh, implementing in schools and getting more schools to on board because the beauty of a decentralized technology is the community or the people behind it, the people who are subscribing to the service. So in terms of uh, the road plan, the roadmap for this project, we want to have more schools um, on board the platform and then make the software open source for more schools to also see what we are building or what we are doing, the transparency of the, of the service. And then from that, we want to be able to commercialize our own part, the data analytics services we are providing, and schools who cannot build this kind of robust analytics could pay for those services. So we can deploy in schools, and then also we can also work with uh, maybe government agencies that want to have schools adopt this project. And then also we want to work with education startups that are basically looking at a way to connect, to get insights for their users. For well, currently edtech startups, they don't have access to classroom data from the schools. They have to build from scratch. So there is a problem, the cold start problem. There's a learner coming in, they are, not, they are not learning for the first time. They have a problem, that's why they are coming. But you don't know, you have to first diagnose before you solve. So but with our system on the blockchain, they can connect to the network and get insights about these users that are coming to their platform. So that's another opportunity for us to also uh, monetize uh, this product. So for, but now the main thing we want to drive is get more partnership, more collaboration with institutions. So we are hoping maybe uh, with your network, you can also get to have more schools uh, on board our platform in the trial phase, where they get to use the technology and test it. And then we also provide insights back to the teachers and the students as well. Thank you. Uh, I thought, uh, Khaled, do you have any questions or comments? Just a comment. We, we just invested into an edtech company um, that is present into eight different countries in Africa. Uh, if you could send me a, a deck and um, and I'll make you a, a commercial deck and I'll connect you to, to, to them. One of our best investments was also in education. This is uh, uh, an engineering, uh, 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 traditional engineering school, basically, that, uh, that we developed in North Africa. That's also one that I think that could be interesting. Uh, I can also connect you to them. Okay. Thank you very much. You're welcome. All right. Uh, Ricky, do you have no, I think the concept is, you know, very interesting. Um, but given you're playing with, you know, working with universities, you know, governments, uh, I'm, I'm guessing there's a lot of regulations and things you have to overcome. Um, given, you know, there's publicly owned schools and private schools, and then there's everything in between. So, how, how, what kind of barriers have you kind of faced in terms of regulation working with these clients, and how do you, how are you trying to kind of break through that? Right. Thank you very much. Yeah. So in terms of working uh, with the government, um, uh, the government currently for us has been supportive in terms of like, uh, so we've got lots some projects within the research group that are focused on using learning analytics to support students. So it's more like the directive is coming from the government towards moving to uh, data driven education. So it's more like the right timing for us to come in and provide this kind of service. But that said, uh, we respect implementation in schools. We still fail to face some kind of hurdle, like in terms of teachers adopting it, because in some cases, teachers are not used to these technology tools. And then you mentioned blockchain, they're like, oh, how do I use the blockchain? And then it's a whole different thing. So the need to create that awareness of how these tools would help even make their work easier needs to uh, be set in motion as well. And then also for us to find better ways to communicate whatever we are doing that is going to help them. And then, of course, the privacy. And data protection perspective as well. Thank, thank you very much. So that's uh, four minutes. Uh, thank you so much, yeah, Patrick, for your presentation. Much. And, uh, all right. So for our last presentation, we have Mr. Tarashi Kubo, so who's the CEO of AC Biode.
Yes, sir. Yes. So I'm Tadashi from AC Bio. Uh, so we are a clean tech startup um, with expertise on chemistry and material science. Um, and we are have our laboratory in Kyoto and also have companies uh, in Luxembourg as well as the UK. So uh, we have three different technologies actually. So not only this one that I'm going to explain, but also um, we are developing battery technology for mobility as well as catalyst for plastic chemical recycling. So this one is to upcycle ash into chemical products. It's called adsorbent. So ash is one of the biggest problems in anywhere, anywhere in the world, such as from uh, biomass power plants or insulators of a small sludge, you know, from underground water, paper companies, and the mining waste, and the different stuff. And it costs hundreds of thousands of US dollars every, every year, or sometimes a few million um, every year just to dispose of these ashes because they include heavy metals and so many environmental regulations, especially in Europe and the Western countries, including Japan. So we upcycle on site these ashes into adsorbent, which is uh, its applications are for filters to improve uh, soils, wastewater treatment, and also capture CO2 or greenhouse gas emissions. So we, as a new applications, we are right now developing testing for carbon capture uh, and also uh, to capture oil in, in oil spills, as well as to replace uh, microplastic bees in, in the cosmetic industry as well. So this is one of the data we are testing to capture CO2 and the methane. And also uh, we are testing to mix CO2 and our circulate with the asphalt and concrete to capture in the asphalt, as well as cooling down the, the temperature itself of the asphalt. So this is how our products look like from ashes. It's in the powder form and it captures physically and chemically both sides. We, we have several patents on this process and the recipe. So there are several products already in the market, which are, it's called zeolite and activated carbon. And our differentiations are, uh, we are the only one we can upcycle from the ash and the waste. And the absorption capability is up to two times higher than them. This is the process how it looks like. Um, so right now, uh, we have already successfully completed two plants in Taiwan and in Japan. And we have received uh, eight feasibility study contracts. So not only in Japan, but also we got contracts in Austria, Thailand, Kazakhstan, UK, and we just received two more in Australia. Um, also signed MOU with the UK government, UK company called GCM for to um, upcycle ash in Bangladesh. So in a nutshell, uh, we can increase uh, absorption capability from the existing products. We can upcycle ashes, reduce greenhouse gas emission up to 60% compared with the existing products, and we have several IPs. So our business model is that we don't make machines, we don't build the factory itself, but we provide licensing or engineering to the owners of ash generators. So that means the owners of uh, power plants or energy companies or insulators of a sludge. The market is growing. It's increasing 3.4% each year. It's gonna be 67 billion US by 2025. So this is a time process that we want to develop further our technology to carbon capture, which is a big market. So for example, we could create circular economy within the biomass or coal-fired power plants to make circulate from the ash and cap capture CO2 from the power plants themselves. Here's our team. So uh, we have now 10 members across uh, Japan, also Luxembourg and the UK. 
we have uh, different engineers on chemistry, material science, and environmental science. Oh, by the way, when it comes to the other technology on plastic chemical recycling, uh, we get a feasibility study contract from JICA in Tunis. I was in Tunis last month to study the potential chemical recycling of plastic waste in Tunis, and it is a beautiful country. I really like it. Yes, that's quickly about us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, any questions? Um, Halid also. also, if you have any. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, my question is more about, about the, the business model that you have. Do you work more on a project base, meaning basically that you price for every single project, or do you have like a product that you offer to clients? Uh, yes. So there are two possibilities of business models. So we provide engineering project by project to the owners of energy companies. But uh, uh, once we make salt right from the waste, the clients need to sell to chemical companies or manufacturers that we can support as well. And that product costs approximately a few US dollars each kilogram. And they can generate around nine or 10 million US dollars every year uh, from the products they recycle from the ash. And we, we can get some uh, loyalty fees or we can also sell as a trader. Got it. Got it. And and you have identified specific partners for distribution. How do you distribute your product directly to to the final um, uh, uh, companies, or do you have like local uh, local partnership or local distributors? Um, country by country, we have some agencies. For example, we have some agencies in um, Austria and Australia, uh, but it's case by case basis. Got it. Um, how do you develop those partnerships or how do you look for potential um, clients? Uh, we typically exhibit in exhibitions on the biomass power or waste management, or I often pitch in different locations to get some inquiries from the clients directly. Actually, uh, six clients out of eight I've never met in person yet. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. And, and geographically located all over the world or? Yes, we can do any uh, countries because until the construction of the factory itself, we can work remotely because we just get some data, you know, composition, drawings, and we can do provide engineering based on that and work remotely. Basically. Thank you. Uh, can you attempt the roadmap slide? I, I just remember seeing 12 million. Um, just wanted to kind of understand the kind of, yeah, um, in revenue. So uh, can you kind of break down a little bit more further, like the trajectory and like, where are you now versus your 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 ultimate goal in 2025? Yes. In general, in a nutshell, each project, we can get around 1 million revenue, depending on the size. In addition, once we sell such light from ash, we can create 10, five or 10 million of each project. If we can successfully uh, work as a trader, but it it's depend, depends on, on, the, on the project. And each pro project takes around two or three years to complete. That's why we assume that we can create maybe one or two projects from now to then. Okay, thank you. That's really clear on the, the revenue side. How about like the, the costs? Structure side, like um, typically we can get around forty percent, fifty percent of gross profit. Um, and of course, the more the projects we have, our gross profit rate is uh, higher because we can kind of copy and paste our you know engineering scheme for each project. So, so in terms of um, the, the the manufacturing of your products. Is it, what do you make, man, do you have to manufacture it locally? What is your idea? Do you manufacture it in Japan then export? How do you do that? We provide engineering from Japan or from Luxembourg, uh, but uh, the machines and construction can be done locally, basically, because the machines themselves are not, not so special. So it's better to locally procure so that we can 
reduce the, the capex. Still have room for one question. All right, so I assume that everyone is satisfied by this presentation. Thank you so much. It was a great presentation. All right, um, so with this being said, this was the last presentation. So thank you, a round of applause for all the startups and uh, that presented today. Um, stick around for the, the, the networking session. Come talk to us, exchange some ideas that we're here for and enjoy the tea. Um, before that, we close, I would like to invite Ricky maybe for some closing remarks uh, and also, and if there's a few a parting words that you'd like to share. Yeah, so thank you, everyone. And I want to, again, uh, thank the, the organizers. Uh, so thank you, Kyoto City Prefecture. A round of applause to everyone uh, in the back end. Also, Asen, Shinomori, and Jethro. Thank you, thank you all. Um, it, I think it was a great event, uh, opportunity for us. I think we started off with the history of the temple, covered Kyoto, and then, you know, potential collaborations with um, African ecosystem. Um, so I think that was great. So I'm going to give maybe um, Africa Invest team, um, Halid and uh, maybe just quick words, maybe some takeaways. Um, and then I think we could close for the networking session after that. So I'll start off with which who goes first. So Halid, do you want to kick it off? Just want to thank you, uh, the DFP team, but also everyone that everybody that uh, that has been coming and attending this event and to the entrepreneurs. It's uh, it's uh, it's great to be here, and I, I hope that we can meet in person. And of course, don't hesitate to reach out. I'm thinking about the entrepreneurs uh, specifically. If you have questions, if you think that we can help in any ways, thank you, everyone. Maybe I'll be the last person to do a round of thanks to DFP for organizing this, for all of you for coming, um, for the organizers to Kyoto. Um, very, very grateful. Khalid, you missed a special treat here. So <laughs> we'll have to bring Khalid back. Um, and thank you all for being here. There's a lot of exciting opportunity, I think. What I took away from this event is that there are so many pathways for collaboration uh, across a range of different um, industries uh, and areas. Very exciting to hear these startup uh, ideas uh, and look forward to seeing what they become. So thank you all. Thank you. Just lastly, it was a, a very important for us to have this at this timing, given that in August, the uh, TCAD will be happening um, the Japan Africa conference will ha be happening in Tunis yes. for the first time. It's usually in Japan. So it's only the second time that it's going to happen in Africa. So we're going to be seeing a lot of announcements, partnerships, collaborations there. Uh, so I want to make sure that um, we come here before that to create a momentum into it. So with that, uh, thank you very much. And we'll be closing. Um, and so very quickly, so the events, uh, so in TCAD also on the side, sidelines, there will be also an event that will be focusing specifically on venture capital and private equity. And so for anyone attending TCAD, it will happen after uh, the plenary sessions and uh, the, the, the business forum organized by Jetro. So if uh, you're already there, of course, uh, stop by. We'll be uh, rounding up some investors, not only from Tunisia, but also the African ecosystem. And we're trying to continue to build this connection between Japan and Africa and keep the conversation about startups venture capital and PE alive in the general conversation of between Africa and Japan. So uh, thank you very much for coming today. And uh, right, looking forward to talking more.